Let's get this day started. Well, welcome everyone to uh, to Chapter Three, the third annual Aldi ISD Literacy Matters Conference. So glad that all of you have decided to join us this morning. My name is Todd Davis. I'm the Chief Academic Officer here in Aldi ISD, and I have the honor to opening us up today and kicking off this great day of learning. Again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We have some of the nation's best literacy leaders, and of course, the very best from Aldi ISD that that are coming together today to lead us through a great day of learning around literacy and an opportunity for all of us to grow and collaborate. And really when it comes to the end of the day, just making sure that we're getting it right when it comes to literacy instruction. With all of the, you know, the debate around literacy, it's not about being right, it's about getting it right for our students. And today is a day about coming together, learning and growing and getting it right for our students. Because again, at the end of the day, that's what they all deserve. We all have a responsibility to set them on a track for success in life and choices and opportunities in their future. And today I am confident that we are gonna to come together and grow around those that responsibility. Now, before we get started, I need to make sure that I take a moment to thank our Aldean leaders who made this event a reality. Our teaching and learning department has come together and, and just been outstanding in volunteering their time to organize this event on top of a very tireless and sometimes are, are very tiring, excuse me, and thankless job, uh, they put together this opportunity for us. And um, again, so very thankful. Two of the tenants in our in our teaching and learning department are continuous growth and a service mentality. And today's conference is definitely uh, an example of both of those tenants coming to life. So thank you, teaching and learning. And of course, Angela Kala here, our pro program director, She's representative of the of the department and um, and just excellence all around us. And then, of course, I, I need to make sure that I take a moment to thank Grace Delgado, our executive director for multilingual services. Grace has taken the lead in the event um, organization this year, been the glue to make sure that it it all comes together and that it continues to grow and evolve. And today will be uh, it's our third, but it will be our best. And I'm sure of that. And I want to thank you, Grace, for that. All right, and I'm going to pass it over to Grace now, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, I was able to see Wiley Blevins last year, and we needed it. And after that session ended, we all agreed we got to bring him back, and he's got to kick us off. And I'm so glad that you're here to do that. And Grace, I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Good morning. Buenos dias, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. It has been a super exciting to work uh, with the fantastic Aldine team. Uh, to prepare for this third annual uh, Literacy Matters Conference. Uh, I'm elated to be here uh, this morning because we have a great lineup of sessions. Uh, we're gonna address literacy by literacy, differentiation, reading in all content areas, um, SDL and our families as well. Um, there's a couple of housekeeping items that I wanna cover before we jump into our, our keynote and our sessions. Um, today, we're gonna have sessions every hour on the hour and attendance will be taken at every session. So there's gonna be a facilitator at every session dropping a link for attendance so participants can log their attendance uh, because the conference survey and certificates are gonna be sent to you guys next week. Um, we will end our conference today at three o'clock, um, but then those are the main things that we need for um, housekeeping. So now uh, we're gonna jump into our keynote session. Um, our keynote speaker, like Dr. Davis mentioned, is Wiley Blevins. Um, Wiley Blevins is an early reading specialist who holds um, a master's in education from Harvard. He taught elementary school in both the United States and South America. Wiley has written and edited many phonics and reading materials, and he is the author of numerous best-selling professional books. We are super excited that he's here this morning. So. Uh, welcome to Literacy Matters, uh, Mr. Blevins. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and, and welcome, everyone. I was really excited about today's topic, creating equity, equity through literacy, because I was one of those kids who really depended on the local school system to give me everything I needed 
to become a, a skilled reader to open up the world of possibility and fill in some gaps that I had before I got to school. Those of you who have heard me speak before know a little bit about that story. I'm originally from a very rural community in the mountains of West Virginia, and I come from what I always describe as a legacy of illiteracy. I come from a very long line of people who never learned to read or write. In fact, my grandparents couldn't read or write on my dad's side of the family, and my grandmother on my mom's side only went to school to the fifth grade. And I was particularly struck by my grandmother's shame around not being to being able to read, how she would make excuses when we were in public. Oh, I didn't have my glasses. And we knew grandma didn't wear glasses. Or she would sometimes hold the menu upside down at a restaurant. Or she would always insist on being the last to order. And I asked my sister one day why that was. And she said, well, grandma only knows what's on the menu by what we order. So let's always choose something grandma likes. So we had some strategies around that. People would come and read her mail to her and so on. And I think that really, really affected how I thought about reading and the importance of reading as a very young child. So I was one of those kids who didn't grow up in a home with books. I wasn't surrounded by books. I didn't have all those rich literacy experiences that, that we hope that our students have before they get to our schools. But I can't say we didn't have any books because we were from the rural South. We did have one book and you can probably guess what that book is. The Bible, it sat prominently on our, our living room, uh, in, in our living room on the, on the table. Ours was white, it looked just like this. It had gold trim, it was so fancy and big and it would sparkle when the light hit it. And in the front of this Bible, there were these pages that looked like something from hundreds of years ago, where my mom would record the family history. So if someone was born, that was recorded. Someone got married, that was recorded. Someone passed away, that was recorded. But we also have a tradition that some people find a little strange where I'm from, that if someone passes away, we actually take a photograph of them in their casket and we put in the family Bible to remember them by. And so as a young child, sometimes I would be curious about this thing called a book that sat on our coffee table and I would go over it, I would open it. And as soon as I would open it, what would happen? Out would fly pictures of dead people and I would fly out of the room. And so I tell people, literally, I was scared of books for the first five years of my life because the only book I knew had dead people in it. And I really had no interest in, in spending much time in that world. But everything changed when I got to school. When I went to school, we didn't learn formal reading until first grade. Kindergarten was very, very, very different from the way it is today. My first grade teacher was Mrs. Warshaw, and she handed me this book you see in front of you, The New Fun with Dick and Jane. Some of you might remember uh, the Dick and Jane series. It kind of trailed off in the late 1960s, but it was basically a sight word reader. She would teach us these words, would read stories about Dick and Jane, their little sister Sally, and their dog Spot, and we'd learn a few more words, and we would uh, read stories that only had those words that she had formerly taught, and I loved it, and there was high drama. I remember we were never allowed to read ahead in, in, our, in our books, and one Friday, Sally fell into the clothes hamper, and I couldn't find out if she survived until Monday, and I spent the whole weekend really worried that Sally was suffocating in the clothes hamper, but she survived, and everything was good, so there was a little bit of, of drama in those stories, but Mrs. Warshaw knew that wasn't enough, she knew that that didn't give us access to words quickly enough. So she also gave us something that looked very similar to this plaid workbook that you see in the corner. It was a phonics workbook. And she taught us about our letters and sounds. And the way she described it made it feel so simple to me. It felt like a puzzle. She said, we have these letters. And by themselves and together, they stand for different sounds. So I'm going to teach you these letter sounds or these spelling sounds so that you can read words. And so as she began teaching us these letter sounds, all of a sudden, I had access to all these words. And I remember being in church one day and the, the preacher was reading and I was hearing all these weird words, thee, thou, doeth. And I looked down and they all had something in common. They all had the letters TH. And I figured out how to pronounce the TH spelling before Mrs. Warshaw taught it because she taught it like a system. I understood how the system worked. We were very uh, used to observing words and talking about words so I could run with the system. And that's what is ideal for, for our students. So once I figured out that books didn't all have dead people in them, there was some drama and some, and I could access some of the words. I wanted to read everything I could get my hands on, but we didn't have a local library. We were a very poor community. We didn't have a school library either. I'm here in New York City and there are a lot of schools here that don't have school libraries, even, even today. 
So, and it, the classrooms weren't filled with books like they are today either. We had our textbook and we had a little box called an SRA kit. Some of you might remember that that had these color coded cards and it was a big deal. You know, I'm on aqua and you're on magenta or whatever the, they were fancy names for the colors. I remember that. So not a lot of books, but once a month we would get this book order form. I don't know if you still use that, but this was like Christmas once a month uh, for me. And I would read these with great interest. And, uh, you know, there was this pop culture magazine called Dynamite that I always wanted to get. And I would go over here and I would check, 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 check all the ones that I wanted and hand it to my mom. And of course she would erase, erase, erase all, but a, a few that we could, that we could afford. But every month I got a box of books. And that opened up the world of reading to me. And these are two books I bought very early on. And I share them with you only because the books I read really affected my reading growth and connects to the conversation we're having today around what people are calling the science or sciences of reading. These two books, and I kept them for my entire childhood, these and others. The first is Runaway Slave, the story of Harriet Tubman. I was fascinated by people's lives. I read a lot of biographies and uh, books about what people, what people did. And Sharks, I was fascinated by the world outside of, of my community. I just pray that someday a shark would swim up our creek so I could pet it or hop on it and, or what have you. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Of course, it wouldn't happen. But when you look at those two books, you notice right away they have something in common. They're both informational. I was what you call an info kid. That was my trigger. So as I was learning to read, most of what I was reading was nonfiction. So I was flooded with new vocabulary that I wasn't hearing in my daily life and flooded with new content. And we now know how important those two things really are. So when I think about what Mrs. Warshaw did, she taught me phonics. We have that phonics workbook. We learn about our letters and sounds, and we know that the basic skills we teach in kindergarten, first and second grade, if we teach them to mastery so that students can easily transfer them, they have access to about 84% of the words in English. English isn't the most regular language, but it's a high percentage of words they have access to. So it's a really useful tool. And those high frequency words through those Dick and Jane books, some of which are irregular, don't follow those, those phonics patterns. The top 100 account for about half of the words that our young readers encounter. These are high impact words that affect early reading growth. We need to learn those well. And Mrs. Warshaw taught those well to me. And because I did a lot of reading in informational texts, it really built my vocabulary and background knowledge. So fast forward today, and I'm really, really grateful about everything that Mrs. Warshaw did for me to create an equitable learning situation for a kid who didn't come to school with a lot of, of, of the typical kinds of resources you would hope that uh, a child had or the experiences, she really filled in those gaps for me. So here today, we're having this national conversation around the science or sciences of reading. All it really is is a big body of knowledge. I know you're hearing a lot about it. A lot of this knowledge comes from us, classroom teachers and educational researchers, but there are these other sciences and these other scientists like linguists and cognitive scientists who do brain research and so on, who are asking the same questions we're asking. How do we best teach children to read? And what they're finding, some of it is really confirming what we're doing, really helping us better understand why it's working. And that's exciting to, to find out. But there are some other things, we'll talk about a couple of them today that they're finding out that's really asking us to take a step back and think differently about what we're doing because we now understand how that's not working as effectively as it should be. For me, when I think about phonics instruction in particular, it's really about the efficiency of that instruction. How do we fine tune it to really accelerate student learning? And every year we're all learning things that we can just take it to the next level so that we get students to mastery as quickly as possible, accelerate their learning so they can then transfer those skills and we can move on to other things that we need to be focusing on in our instruction. Of course, when we think about the science of reading, it's not a program or a philosophy or anything like that. It's just a body of knowledge. We know a lot. There's still some things we're figuring out, some questions that I have and other researchers have, but we know a great deal. We know more than we ever have, thanks to all of these, these sciences coming together and helping us. So it's an exciting time to be in. There is sort of this hyper focus on phonics, which is why I get asked to, to talk to a lot of, of schools and school districts. But the science of reading, of course, isn't just about phonics. Phonics is just an area where there was certainly a need for improvement in a, in a lot of schools. And so we're trying to get that right and to improve what's happening. And these models of reading that we hear, 
really help to put phonics in its proper place and talk about these other things we need to be talking about as well. So I'm sure most of you who have attended any kind of uh, conferences or sessions recently have heard about these old models of reading, like the simple view of reading or Scarborough's reading rope. I'll just talk about the simple view of reading for the sake of time today. But this came out in the mid 1980s when I first started teaching. It was developed by Guff and Tunmer. And it's pretty direct. What they said is that in order for us to understand what we read, it's a product of our ability to decode, to access the words on the page and our language comprehension skills, our vocabulary, our background knowledge, and one without the other doesn't lead to skilled reading. So if in the primary grades, we put all of our eggs in the decoding bucket, and we don't spend enough time equally and simultaneously building students' knowledge, their vocabulary and what have you, they won't have all the tools they need as they move up to the grades. Because when they get to those intermediate grades, we want that foundation in both buckets to be really firm so that they can focus their mental energies on those new concepts, on that new vocabulary and so on. So even though I'm always asked to talk about phonics when I'm visiting a school, I always ask, what is your read aloud strand or program in your primary grades and your intermediate grades? How are you systematically building knowledge and building vocabulary in the same way that we're talking about doing that systematically for decoding? And often there isn't an answer and it's something that we need to explore. There is a movement in this country right now about organizing what we read to students and what we have them read around, around topics, these, these uh, knowledge-based uh, text sets. So we might be reading to our young, our young readers for several weeks about animal habitats and then go to solar system or what have, whatever the topics are that are important so that there's a lot of repetition in the vocabulary and in the concepts, a lot of opportunities to have deep conversations and repeat that vocabulary and those concepts to deepen that understanding. So there's a lot going on right now. Uh, so here again, it's a really exciting time in a lot of areas in which we can just uh, move the needle even more to benefit our students. So I always think about how can we turn all that we know about the science of reading into our superpower as teachers so we can better better uh, assist the needs of in the wide range of needs of our students. So we really need to focus on what really moves the needle. And when it comes to phonics for our for our early learners, we know that there are these seven characteristics of strong phonics instruction. I've been working on these with these for, for decades. We want to make sure they are firmly in place. We want to make sure we have a solid scope and sequence that serves as the spine of our instruction. We want to make sure that we're teaching students how to blend or sound out words and giving them lots and lots and lots of practice to do that. We know the benefits of that. We wanna make sure that we're doing dictation or guided spelling where we're teaching children how to transfer that phonics knowledge into writing every week so that they become uh, very fluid in doing that. We want word awareness activities like word building and word sorts with follow-up conversations that get students really becoming flexible in their use of their phonics skills and having rich conversations. I always talk about how great phonics instruction is active, it's engaging and it's thought provoking. We need lots of talk, lots of doing, uh, so opportunities for students to observe words like I did as a young child and to make their thinking public so that we can better help move the needle for them. And of course, what we read during phonics, how much we read and the quality and characteristics of that text can make an enormous difference on student progress. So we'll talk about that in just a second as well. We also want to correct some imbalances in our early phonics instruction. I always talk about the decoding encoding imbalance. We do a lot of work with helping children sound out words, but not enough in terms of encoding or helping them spell words. So we have children who move through the grades who do okay reading the words, but can't spell to save their lives. You probably encountered some of that. When we look at the state standards, decoding and encoding get equal prominence in many state standards across the country. So we need to make sure that our instruction is equally balanced. And that encoding piece really helps children understand how words work in such a powerful way. We also want to avoid those 10 reasons why phonics instruction sometimes fails. A lot of my work since around 2010 has been centered around working with schools who have phonics materials in place and assessments and what have you, but aren't getting the results they need. And what I've discovered over, over the, my work is that there are these obstacles that stand in the way of student progress. And most of these obstacles can be removed by the classroom teacher. And so spend a lot of time working with districts trying to unplug 
those obstacles so that we can accelerate learning. The first is one of the most common and inadequate or non-existent review and repetition cycle. A lot of instruction is very exposure focused. We teach one skill one week, we go to a new skill the next week, we go to a new skill the next week without very much else happening. And we know that once we introduce a skill, for many children, it takes about four to six weeks of consistent review and repetition and application to get to mastery in both reading and spelling. And spelling takes a lot longer. So we often, when I work with schools, I often have to go in and build in that review and repetition cycle, that distributed practice, that cumulative assessments and all the things that are gonna be so critical. So for example, if I'm teaching short A in week one, and then in weeks two, three, four, five, I'm doing all the other short vowels. I'm not going to forget about short A. If we're doing blending. If we're reading a decodable text, if we're doing dictation or word building, short A words are going to be there. So that that week where I introduce it is just the beginning of the work, the beginning of the exploration. That is so critical. If we don't do that, what happens for some of our students and far too many of our students is that great instruction we provide that first week begins to slip away. It's what I refer to as decayed learning. And I know many of you have probably encountered students who taught something one week and about a month later, it's like you never said anything. And it can be very frustrating that learning can decay quickly if we don't maintain it. And that leads into our assessments. I can't assess just beginning, middle, and end of the year. I need to assess cumulatively and, and throughout the entire instruction and look at a skill over multiple weeks to see are they hanging on to it? Are they getting it? Are they starting to easily transfer it? There are all kinds of nuances and very quick, easy assessments we can do to stay on top of that and uh, attack it if it's not if it's not happening. Of course, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but that's really important work for us to consider. And of course, we need to remember it's in the application with the learning sticks. When it comes to early phonics, whenever I observe a lesson, I'm always thinking how much time are the children picking up a book and picking up a pencil. Too much of phonics instruction is, is removed. It's isolated from actual reading and writing. We don't get the instructional impact when that happens. We need to do a little teaching and a lot of applying, a little teaching and a lot of applying. How we spend our instructional minutes really matter. And so just to give you an example of that from the work I started back in 2010, I was just observing lots and lots of teachers to figure out were the were the any obstacles that would bubble up to the surface? And these were two teachers in the same school. They had 30 minutes for their phonics instruction. Teacher A spent 10 minutes doing action rhymes. She would say letter, children would say the rhyme. 10 minutes she did some phonemic awareness. She focused on rhyme, which we know doesn't have the impact as oral blending, which is needed to sound out words, and oral segmentation, which is needed to spell words. Five minutes, she introduced the phonics skill and modeled how to blend or sound out words. In five minutes, she had her students read a story. So of that 30 minutes, there was only five minutes applying it to reading and zero minutes applying it to writing. Whereas teacher B, and this was sort of the other extreme of what I saw, she spent five minutes doing a review warm-up. It was cumulative. She just had these letter cards with all the sound spelling she had taught. She would flash them, students would say the sounds to keep them fresh in their memory, that extended review. Five minutes she spent on phonemic awareness doing oral segmentation, breaking apart of words by sound, which children have to be able to do in order to spell, because when they spell, they think about the individual sounds and attach a letter of spelling. She spent five minutes introducing the phonics skill model blending, and then she spent 10 minutes reading a story and five minutes doing some writing follow up. So in her classroom, her daily schedule had 15 minutes of the 30 minutes in application, so about half. Uh, which really we need to have at least half during our phonics lessons. So when you think about that, you think, oh, not that, that big of a change, but when you think about the cumulative effect of that, teacher A's classroom, five minutes a day of application during phonics gives her students 25 minutes a week, which is 15 hours in the school year. Whereas teacher B, 15 minutes a day gives her students 75 minutes a week, which gives them 45 hours of application you can see that 30 hour advantage those children have 30 more hours to get to mastery quicker so they can then transfer. It's really about the efficiency of our instruction and really protecting the minutes during our phonics lessons and thinking about how we use them for maximum impact. So because we don't have a whole lot of time here today, I just wanted to say anyone who's interested in learning more about those seven characteristics of strong phonics instruction, the 10 reasons why phonics instruction sometimes fails. I did write the International Literacy Association brief on phonics called Meeting the Challenges of Early Literacy Phonics Instruction. It's on their website. 
it's free, it's downloadable. You can also contact me if you can't find it. And it summarized that. It's a very short summary. It's like six or seven pages. And it's also written, it might spark some conversation or some exploration in, with your phonics instruction, but it's also written so that you could share with the families of your students if they're interested in what you're doing with phonics. So it has, it has those multiple uses. So please take advantage if it is of interest to you. So another thing we want to think about in this conversation is how we dig deeper. So there's a lot of information coming at us really fast. And so what's happening is it's all being sort of transmitted at a very surface level. And that is a really dangerous place to be because as we know, the truth and the facts and the details and the nuance is beneath that surface. And if we don't understand that, it can lead to some, some issues, some misunderstandings or misinterpretations or misapplications of that, that research. It's also led to some confusing advice. I get a lot of emails, someone said this and someone said that. What does their research really say or what should I, what should I be doing? So this is a time we're having these conversations. So it's very good to go a little deeper. And I wanna give you some examples of how that's sort of playing out just so that you're a, a, a really careful consumer of the information, especially because of social media and we don't have time to go into lots of details on social media that some of it has become more surfacey. I've started noticing that a lot of preference, people's preferences on how to interpret the research is sort of transmitted as this is the only way and that can be a very dangerous thing or, or, or what have you. So recently, well, not recently, several months ago, I was tagged on social media and my heart always drops when I'm tagged on social media. But someone said, Wiley Blevins isn't science of reading enough because he doesn't do heart words. I've never heard him talk about heart words. And at first I was like, uh oh, <laughs> you know what? And I thought my initial reaction was I remembered in junior high where some of the girls in my class would put little hearts above the eyes. And I thought, well, I certainly don't do that. I don't sign my name Wiley with a little heart above the eye, although I could, but I, I've chosen not to, but maybe I'll change. Um, so I thought, well, what is this really about? And then I thought, are you serious? Now I know what it's really about. So this is a perfect example where surface knowledge can be a little, a little dangerous because the conversation around heart words is really important. So when we're talking about heart words, we're talking primarily about those high frequency words, in particular, those irregular words. So when I was in first grade, Mrs. Warshaw would teach our high frequency words, some irregular, some not in the traditional way. She would write a context sentence on the board like I see a cat. She would underline the new word. She would say the word, what's the word class? We'd say C, and that's really how she taught it. But we know from brain researchers, from cognitive scientists, that in order for us to automatically retrieve a word, we have to go through this process called orthographic mapping. Linnea area talks a lot about, she's a researcher, talks a lot about orthographic mapping. And we know because cognitive scientists are taking these brain pictures, these functional MRIs, they know what parts of the brain need to be activated to become a skilled reader because those parts light up on the screen. It's a very cool thing. And we know that there are these three parts that need to be activated. There's the part where the sounds are stored. So when Mrs. Warshaw said the word C, that part of my brain was activated. There's a part where the meaning needs to be stored. So that context sentence really activated that part. But what wasn't activated is the part where the letters are stored. So in order for us to orthographically map a word into memory so that we can automatically and efficiently retrieve it and be able to pick it out from words that are very similar, we have to attend to the sounds, the spellings, and the meaning of the word, all three parts. So, and this was all words, whether they're regular or fully decodable, all words go through that process. So there's no more of this thinking about the shapes and things like that. That's not doing what needs to happen in order for students to automatically access those words. So there, there are these other routines. So one routine that I use, it's my preference, there are some other ways in which you could do it, is the read, spell, write routine, where I introduce the new word in context, just like Mrs. Warshaw. So if I'm teaching the word said, I might write a simple sentence like, I see a cat said Pam. I'll have children read the word, what's the word said? And then I do some of that deep analysis of the word. I will ask children, what sounds do you hear in said? Let's say those sounds, said, so we hear those three sounds. And then I'm gonna point out the spellings in said. Now, if I'm working with a very young child, I might point out some of the sound spellings they already know to reinforce that. If I'm working with a kindergarten, I might say, what's that first sound in said? What letter do we write when we hear the sound? Do you see the letter as it? You know, go through that conversation. 
But for older children, I will point out the part of the word that is irregular or unknown at that point, the part that they have to remember. And so when it comes to the word said, it's that middle, the spelling for the middle sound. So what is the middle sound in said? Said, it's the S eh sound. When we hear the S eh sound, what do we usually write? The letter E, the students will say, I say, well, do you see the letter E here? No, uh-oh. So I will highlight the spelling for the S eh sound in the word said. So I might underline it, I might circle it, I might write it a different color, or, I could put a heart above it and tell children that's the part that you have to remember by heart. So there are lots of ways to draw attention. Heart words is one really fun, cute way to do it, but you can do other things as, as well. So this is where like preference over what we're really trying to do in terms of the research comes into play. And then we spell the word aloud, S-A-I-D, so it's a choral spell. It's a very young student who still working on learning their letter names, we'll do an echo spell, and then we write it as we say the letter names, S-A-I-D. So read, spell, write. We activate the meaning through the context sentence. The sounds, we say the word as a whole, we say the individual sounds, and then the letters. We focus on that irregular spelling. We spelled it out loud, we spelled it as we wrote it. A very different kind of introduction from that old traditional introduction I see a cat, this is the word C, now you remember it. You see how the science of reading has helped inform us of some very specific things we can do to accelerate student learning. And that's why it's, a, it's a exciting to be able to fine tune what we're doing to really help students who might be struggling with some of these words. But when it comes to orthographic mapping, it's not just those irregular words. We have to orthographically map all words. So Linnea area talks about the importance of whisper reading for our young readers. So when they're reading a decodable text, what are they doing when they get to a word? They're looking at the letter, saying the sound, putting the sounds together and attaching it to meaning. So they're hearing those sounds, hearing the word, attaching meaning, sounds, letter, meaning, orthographic mapping. So it's way beyond just this conversation of, oh, it's a heart, let's put a heart above it. And now we're science of reading. There's so much more underneath the surface that can really benefit us. So when you talk about orthographic mapping, it's attending the sounds and spellings of words, even irregular ones, to commit them to memory so that they can be automatically retrieved. Heart words is one of many ways to achieve this. You can underline, circle, put in color, whatever your preference happens to be. And we must also orthographically map regular or decodable words, not just irregular ones. And whisper reading is one way that we can accelerate that. So when we go beneath the surface, voila, we have lots of great things that can help us when we teach. We also have to be careful about siloing instruction. I'm seeing a lot of this happening where schools are like, uh-oh, we're not doing very well in phonemic awareness. So let's, let's put a phonemic awareness resource in here. Now we have it covered. Everything that we do in our literacy instruction should melt together and should overlap. And there should be these connections. Those things lead to other things. And there are parts of our literacy that we can reinforce, to reinforce other things that we're doing. So when it comes to phonemic awareness, great news, the research, we know it can be taught. And we know that doesn't take a huge amount of time for most of our students and that we need to get students phonemic awareness abilities up to a level at which phonics instruction begins to make sense. So what do I mean by that? So I was observing some kindergarten classrooms in November, a school that I'm doing some work with, and the teacher was doing some oral blending and oral segmentation exercises. She would say some sounds like s, at, put it together. Children couldn't do it. She would say a word sat, tell me the sounds, s, at, children couldn't do it. Then in their phonics, I knew that they were gonna be reading short vowel CBC words and writing short vowel CBC words. I knew they wouldn't be able to do that. I knew that the phonics instruction was going to fall flat, was not going to have impact. So when I looked at, when I, when I look at phonemic awareness, you have to think about how what you're doing in phonemic awareness is building to what they need in reading and writing and the other parts of your literacy block. So I go into a lot of classrooms where I see tons of great phonemic awareness. They're clapping syllables and they're doing rhyme. And then they get to reading and writing and they're supposed to fully sound out words and fully write words where they need to be attending to words at the phoneme or sound level. So that mismatch isn't benefiting students. So in November, these students were expected to read and write CBC words. So we needed to make sure that they were doing lots of oral blending at the sound level, lots of oral segmentation at the sound level prior to that to get them ready to be able to handle those reading and writing demands. So look at your bank of activities. 
how do they really connect to the reading and writing task? Do you have a lot of activities that all children need or just a subset that they need? Do those in whole group. Some of those other activities could be during small group and then you make better use of the time that you're spending with your students. So those students in that kindergarten classroom who couldn't do sort of those basic tasks, we knew the phonics instruction wasn't gonna work unless we did some phonemic awareness triage to get them to really understand how words work. So for a whole month during phonemic awareness, all we did was take apart and put together some of those CDC words through a phonemic awareness activity. So we started out by just having children stretch sounds. So I always, there are lots of ways to do that, but one of the, one of my preferences, I give children these, I give them an imaginary rubber band because I can afford imaginary rubber band and we practice stretching the sound. So like in a word sat, we'll go sat, do it again, sat. And then we get our sound boxes and we move one counter into each box as we stretch those sounds, sat to physically mark the sounds. Children have to be able to do that. That's only half of what they need. Then we rebuild the word. What's that first sound in sat? Sat, what's that first sound? What letter do we write? We place the counter to the letter S and we slowly build that word. Taking apart words, putting it together in that very structured way is what they needed to get over the hurdle so that phonics instruction makes sense. There's a lot of talk now about including print with phonemic awareness, which is confusing to a lot of teachers who always heard it was only oral. And, that's, and this is an example of what that really means. We start out with the, the oral and we move to the print and make those connections very explicit so that these activities have maximum impact. Another thing is to follow up when we're reading a decodable text with writing. So if I read a, if I read a decodable text, here's one from grade one, has lots of long A words and I have children write a retelling of that story, they're gonna to have to use lots of long A words. So I'm forcing them to apply, to transfer that skill into writing, which is very difficult, um, but they have that book there as a scaffold so they can go in and find those words. It's an activity I can easily differentiate. I can provide some multilingual, uh, for my multilingual learners, I can provide some sentence frames and starters at different levels of language acquisition. I can give a word bank with some more sophisticated words for my students who need a challenge. And everyone is writing about this and getting what they need. But then the next day we reread it. Children reread their own stories to develop fluency and we revise based on things we're working during our writing. Whatever the lesson is during our writing later in, you know, in that literacy block, if we're doing combining sentences, we're going to revise and combine some sentences. If we're doing an aspect of punctuation or capitalization or grammar, or we're doing vivid verbs, something, we're carrying it over. Everything is overlapping. We want to make sure that everything we do connects in that way. And there's lots of opportunities throughout every lesson, even phonics lessons for that built-in review and repetition. And the other grades, we want to read lots of decodable text. Decodable texts are, of course, a practice tool, and there's a lot of conversation around them. I do a lot of work now with making sure that they're a more impactful resource. One of the reasons we're talking about decodable text is because of these other sciences like brain researchers, cognitive scientists, uh, who have really sort of opened our eyes into the impact of the, the text that we use with our beginning readers. And one of the studies that gets a lot of attention is out of Stanford, a brain research study out of Stanford by Dr. McCandless. And he had these, it's fascinating, he had these two groups of participants taught them the sound spelling system. One group, he had them sound out the word, what we'd call phonics. The other group, they learned words as whole units. And if you look at this first bullet, what he found is that, oh, and then he had them read and he took these brain pictures, these functional MRIs to see what parts of the brain were being activated. So our brains are wired for language, but they aren't wired for reading. And so when we teach children to read, we are getting that brain wired to become a skilled reader. And what he found out with the beginning readers who were um, blending, sounding out the words, beginning readers who focus on letter sound relationships or phonics instead of trying to learn whole words, increase activity in the area of their brains best wired for reading. So the parts of the brain that were being activated and lining up on these functional MRIs were the parts that need to, to be a skilled reader, the parts that activate when we are skilled readers. So the physical act of sounding out words is doing something in our brains that our young readers really need. And that is really helpful for us to know. Words learned using a whole word method activated the right side of the brain, which is characteristic of children and adults who struggle with reading. So the, the 
participants who are learning the whole words and reading that way, a different part of the brain is being activated, not the part that needs to. And the part that's being activated is common with, as you see, children and adults who have difficulties reading. Really, really interesting um, research. And I could talk about this for a long time, but we only have a few minutes left and I have some other things to go to, but it's really interesting research. I talk a lot with kindergarten teachers about this, first grade teachers about this, the importance of having those decodable texts, lots of opportunities to sound out words, um, orthographically map those words and so on. There's so much to this uh, really interesting and beneficial research for us to help us fine tune what we're doing. So of course, decodable texts, their purpose is to practice sounding out words, to get to fluency quickly, mastery quickly, so that we can then transfer it. But here again, I think we have to think about if we're using this tool, what other things can we do with this tool that children need? And so I'm always thinking about how I can expand and overlap and connect what I'm doing in every part of the literacy lesson. So you know, before I read a decodable text, I'm, of course, I want to introduce a skill. We're going to do handwriting. There's a lot of research about handwriting and saying the sound as you write the letter to make that connection really strong and the physical motion and all of that. We're going to model how the blender sound out words, teach our high frequency, all the things that I typically see. But there are other things that we can do. So, for example, I work with a lot of children who have vocabulary needs. Decodable texts aren't designed to build vocabulary. They're very, very simple. You know, a book, a decodable book like Lots of Frogs, might have text like, I see a frog, it can hop, 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 hop. We're not building a lot of vocabulary. But I could, during my read aloud time, remember we're reading aloud lots of books around concepts to develop vocabulary and background knowledge. I could read a nonfiction book like Red Eye Tree Frog, where we talk about frog habitats and carry over that language and that conversation to the reading of this book. That's what I started trying at first. And when you can make those connections, it's really great, but you can't always. So I wanted something that I could do with every single little book, every single little decodable I picked up. So what I decided to start doing is to preview the book and select a tier two academic word that wasn't in the book, but I could use to talk about the book to elevate the language we use around the book, around that time. Anything I can do to keep leveling up, I wanted to do. So here's a, a story about a little girl who's going to Spain. She's riding a train. It's in the month of May, so lots of long A words. And what she's doing is she's exploring this new place. So I thought explore is a really good tier two academic word that's very useful. So I told the children today, we're going to read a story about a girl that goes to a new place. And we're going to learn about all the things that she will explore. Say explore. So they say that word. Part of the brain is being activated. And then I quickly introduce it using the define example ask routine, which Isabel Beck created. I define it using very simple kid-friendly language. Explore means to find out more about something. What does explore mean? They would repeat the definition. I give them an example using very, that's relevant to their lives. So maybe something we're exploring in science class. And then I ask them a question that requires them to use the word before we read. What new place would you like to explore? or find out more about. So I, I emphasize that definition in the question. They turn to a partner, they use the word explore. Then as we read, we stop every couple pages and I say, well, tell your partner what she's exploring now. Oh, she went to a, a castle. What would you like to explore if you went to castle? Oh, you'd be exploring that. Oh, that's a great exploration. You just see how that conversation is very, very different from a typical decodable text conversation. So there are things like that we can do before. And after reading, there are a ton of things that we can do to really take those conversations to the next level. So we might read it that first day just to work through, but we're gonna revisit it. And a lot of people say, well, there's not a whole lot you can do. These books are pretty basic. Yeah, they're not Shakespeare, but there are a lot of early reading behaviors that we can and need to develop, even with these simple texts. So I've come up over the years with sort of five types of questions I ask. There's nothing magical about the five. It really is just that's what I have time to do. But I asked a series of questions that force children to go back into the book to do rereading, to develop more fluency. I don't call on volunteers to answer the questions. It's a huge part of this activity. I ask the question and children discuss it with partners first, and then we they share out because all children need to be processing uh, their thinking, using language and so on. So my first question, I'll just give you a couple examples because we are short of time. My first question is I focus on a word with the new phonics skills. So in this book, I ask, where did the girl go on a trip? Point to the country's name. So they have to go in and reread. So I'm tricking them into doing more fluency building. They find the word, they share with the partner, and then they share out. The second word, I ask a very low level question, but I require them to 
provide text evidence to answer it. That is an early reading behavior we can start developing in kindergarten. Show me the evidence that that's the right answer. That's important in reading. It's also really important when they're writing, we're asking them for evidence. So notice how I asked the second question. What do the girl do in Spain? Find the sentences that tell this. So they have to go in and reread, find the sentences. So there are lots of reading, find the sentence that answer it read those sentences to the partner, have a conversation or a debate or an argument, if that's the right evidence, and then share out. Lots of reading, lots of thinking, lots of talking. Those are the kinds of experiences we need to have with these very simple texts. Then I asked some higher level questions. What problems did she have? They had to find information on multiple pages. Where might the girl go on her next trip? Why do you think this? That's an inference question. There's lots of inferencing that has to happen in these simple texts because the text is so basic, there are always things in the pictures and the photos that carry some of the meaning. And then I connect it to students' lives. What kind of big trip would you like to go on? But because I pre-taught that tier two academic word explore the day before, I add it to that question. What kind of big trip would you like to go on? What would you like to explore there? So we're using that academic language for subsequent days. So that's one way of, of transforming that. The other thing I've been doing a lot of work in is around syntax. There are so many children as they go through the grades and they encounter increasingly more complex text, they really struggle connecting ideas across sentences or unpacking difficult sentences. So the teachers I work with now in kindergarten and first grade, we are trying to establish that behavior, those behaviors, those routines, so it becomes easier to do that and more natural to do that and to really help those intermediate grade teachers who have so many children who are struggling. Let me just show you two really basic examples very, very quickly. This uh, particular, these are two sentences from this story. One day Pam rode in a train, she paid a lot for it. In terms of decoding, it's very simple. Children can get through that quite easily. In terms of making meaning, it's very tough. That second sentence is particularly difficult. The first sentence, we have the name of a specific girl, we have a name of a specific object, but none of that exists in the second sentence. Everything's replaced by pronouns, simpler words, and so on. So in order for children to understand it, they have to be carrying ideas across sentences. So when I get to sentences like that in the text, I will just stop and say, well, who is she? Who are we talking about here? And students will say, oh, it's Pam. So we'll draw the arrow. One day Pam rode in a train, Pam paid a lot for it. That makes sense. Look at these next two sentences. These aren't from the story, they're about the story to illustrate the concept that children encounter. She went to see a museum. She had to wait in the long line to get inside it. I'll say, well, what is it? We know it's a museum. A lot of children will say train or they'll say the long line because that's the most recent noun. So we connect it to what it is. We reread the sentence. She had to wait in the long line to get inside a museum, making sure we're connecting ideas, walking children through that and modeling and making sure they develop those habits. We need to start right away. When we have really long, complex sentences like this last sentence, typically wouldn't see that in a kindergarten or grade one, but you would as you go up, it, it, it's just way too long. So what I would do is I would chunk it into meaningful chunks and have children echo read it to illustrate how each chunk adds meaning. So I would read, she had to wait. Children would echo, she had to wait. And I would ask where, where does she have to wait? In a long line, right, let's read those two parts. She had to wait in a long line. Why did she have to wait in a long line? to get inside it, to get inside the museum. Let's read those three parts. She had to wait in a long line to get inside the museum. You can do that in kindergarten. Pam ran, who's it about? What does she do? Pam ran to the bus, who is it about? What does she do? Where? To the bus. And that really carries over to students writing. So if they write a simple sentence like Pam ran, ask where, why? Add that to your sentence. So you get students very naturally creating more complex sentences. In fact, the opposite of doing this is a follow-up activity where we just do a writing experience. Well, I'll write a simple sentence about the story like Pam had to wait and ask those same questions. Who remembers where Pam had to wait? Let's write that sentence together. Like if it's an interactive writing, Pam had to wait in a long line. Who remembers why she had to wait? Oh, to get inside the museum. Let's write those that sentence. Now let's read our two sentences. Pam had to wait in a long line. Pam had to wait to get inside the museum. What's the same in both of these sentences? And children will see, you know, Pam had to wait. Well, I want to combine those sentences. So I need to get rid of Pam had to wait in that second sentence. So let's combine it. Pam had to wait in a long line because 
I provide the connector word. She wanted to get inside the museum. So they start learning how to combine sentences and what ideas uh, certain words do to combine and all that. So many rich kinds of experiences that we, that we need. And when we're talking about equity, we also need to reflect all the students in our classroom. There's this great work from Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop out of Ohio State. She's, she talks about windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors for the books that we provide our children. She says, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. So here again, she talks about making sure all children have mirror books in their hands when they're learning to read, books that reflect them and their authentic experiences so they understand the importance and the value of their story. She talks about window books that are about people and children who might be a bit different so that children can see and understand people's lives who have some similarities, but some differences, and also about sliding glass doors, these really wonderful free passageways into the world of imagination, or it could be a sliding glass door into a world of nonfiction where you get to go underwater and learn about a shark or what have you, but having a good balance of all of these books. And so sometimes uh, teachers will say, well, I don't have children from this community or what have you, so I don't, I don't need those mirror books. But really you do, because some mirror books for some children are amazing window books for other children. So I published a, a series, I'll tell you about this in a second, the Powell Mystery Series written by Joseph Ruchak, who's tribally enrolled in the Abenaki Nation. So Native American children really see themselves in this book, but other children also learn about contemporary Native American children. So it's a great window for them and insight into their life life and the ways that they're similar and some really interesting and wonderful things that make them a little bit different and uh, aspects of their culture. In terms of children's publishing, there every year there are these counts made in terms of the representation. This was the count in 2018. It hasn't changed a whole lot. But of the books published that year, 50% of the main characters were white and 27% had main characters that were animals or objects. So bears, trains, trucks, and so on. And then you see the percentage for children of color, like 10%, the main characters were African-American all the way down to about 1% for, for Native American. When you add up all of the books with children of color as main characters, it's less than the books with main characters that are bears or trucks. And so we have a real issue trying to get enough books into children's hands so they all see the, those mirrors. And it's really, really important that children see their stories and understand the value of their stories. So I am a children's book writer. A lot of people don't know that. They just think of me as the, the phonics guy. <laughs> That's okay. But I do write a lot of children's books and I also run a small imprint. I'm the associate publisher of a small imprint and our imprint is focused on publishing books by authors and illustrators from underrepresented communities. And some of you are going to win in the raffle one of the books that I published called My Hands Tell the Story. So I'm very excited about that. But let me give you just some examples of what is happening now in publishing. So Christine Taylor Butler is a well-known author. She's like, there are a lot of books that my, my children read uh, that have African-American characters. They're about civil rights and about discrimination, things that are really important. But I want to write about Black joy. I want them to see themselves and to see our family in those books too. So we published a book called The Get Together. That's just this joyous family gathering. I, I describe it as it's about food, family, a little fighting and a lot of fun. And the family is getting together in a home much like where Christine grew up. There's this one scene at the beginning of the book where an auntie is in the kitchen straightening her niece's hair. And it says the aromas of sizzling chicken and frying hair float from the kitchen. And Audrey, you always uses too much grease on both. So it's this really authentic, authentic portrayal and experience of this family. But when you visit, you don't want to leave this home. Any child who reads this wants to spend more time with this family. Kelly Starling, Starling Lyons, another well-known author, talks a lot about uh, what she learned from her from her grandparents. So she wanted to write some intergenerational stories. So My Hands Tell a Story, which some of you will get, was named one of the best uh, multicultural books of 2022. And it, it's about a little girl who's cooking with her grandmother. She notices her hand and the grandmother starts to tell stories about the ring, about the creases and what have you. And you realize all the stories that 
the grandmother had, the little girl begins to also realize all the stories she has, that she can tell all the stories that she wants to tell. There's this lovely, there's this really lovely scene in the book. Grandma's hands knead down to a smooth ball that will rise like magic. I look at my hands and wonder if they will ever move like hers. Grandma places the dough into a grease ball I cover with a cloth. Making bread takes time, she says, so we sit and wait. We sit and talk. Her hands tell a story if you listen. And then Winston Bingham, who wrote the award-winning book Soul Food Sunday, did a whole series for me about military kids. She was in the military, served in the military as a disabled vet. I come from a military family. Military families are such an important part of our culture. You always see on the news the dad or mom coming home and the kid crying in these big scenes. But we don't have books about what it's like to grow up in a military family. And so I wanted children to see that. And so these are some kids who are growing up on a military base. So these are the kinds of things that are starting to happen in some of the work that I'm doing. So how do we turn the science of reading into you? your superpower? Embrace your impact. You have so much impact. I always talk about how giving the gift of reading is one of the greatest gifts we can give children because as a gift once given can never be taken away, but will forever transform a child's life. What you do every day is literally transforming children's lives. You are opening up the world of possibility. I think it's such a huge honor to give that gift to children, but also an enormous responsibility to do it right and to do it well. So I wanna thank you all for everything that you do to do it right and to do it well. I wanna thank you for joining Aldine and all the people who put this together today. And I hope you have a really wonderful and impactful day. Thank you so much, Mr. Blevins. And thank you to all our participants for joining us this morning. So make sure that you visit the chat. That's where you are gonna find the attendance link and you will be participating in uh, the raffle for this 100 books of the wonderful recommended book by Mr. Blevins. So we'll be doing that drawing. Make sure you uh, complete the form for the attendance link. Again, it's gonna be located in the chat box. And we are getting ready to start our first uh, session, nine o'clock sessions. So uh, once you complete your attendance, please go ahead and look at your selection. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a wonderful learning literacy day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.